Peter B. Collins News and Comments. It's Thursday, March 2nd, 2017. And a special programming note tomorrow. We'll be doing another Facebook Live video feed at 2 o'clock Pacific, 5 o'clock Eastern Time. But that's not all. We're going to test out the Facebook Live feed and take telephone calls just like I used to do in talk radio. And if you're listening before Friday at uh, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, you can jot down the phone number here. It's 415-455-0102. That puts you through to the secret studio here. Again, the number is 415-455-0102. And I'm planning to take calls for about half an hour. We'll see how it goes, see how the Facebook fans uh, interact with the old style of uh, phone-in talk shows. And uh, if it works, we'll keep doing it. And if not, well, well, we'll keep trying things and see what really does work with the new technology. So just before I sat down to record today's podcast, I learned that Attorney General Jeff Sessions, responding to the pounding that he has received in the last 20 hours or so, has agreed to recuse himself from any involvement in investigations into the allegations of uh, some sort of involvement between the Trump campaign and Russian officials. This has been based on a parade of leaks, and uh, it remains a, a set of unproven contentions. But we do know that in his confirmation hearing, prodded by questions from Al Franken, that then-Senator Sessions flatly said that he did not have any communications with the Russians. Now, what's fascinating to me is the corporate media is afraid to call a lie a lie. Now, there are some Democrats we'll get to in a moment who are calling it perjury, which is a pretty high standard to achieve. But Republicans can't even bring themselves to describe this as a false statement. And in the news media, they use the passive voice voice that it appears to be untrue, that it appears to be a contradiction to his testimony. And I find this amusing and troubling at the same time. Because we find ourselves unable to honestly call out someone who's being dishonest. And when you listen to the recording of the response that Sessions gave to Senator Franken, he essentially volunteered that he had no communications with the Russians. And we now know that he met with the Russian ambassador at the Republican convention in Philadelphia. He gave a talk to a Heritage Foundation group, and there were a bunch of diplomats there. And then there is this unexplained visit to Sessions' office at the Senate in September of last year. So the calls for recusal have included Jason Chaffetz, the Utah Republican who heads the House Oversight Committee, and fellow Senator Rob Portman of Ohio. I think it would be best for him and for the country to recuse himself from the DOJ Russia probe. So... That was as far as you could get Republicans today. Chuck Schumer, leader of the Democrats in the Senate, called on Sessions to resign. So did Nancy Pelosi, leader of the House Democrats. Sessions, quote, is not fit to serve as the top law enforcement of our country, uh, law enforcement officer of our country, and must resign. And those two people in particular maintained radio silence for three years after it was established that James Clapper, the director of national intelligence, lied brazenly and under oath when Ron Wyden, the senator from Oregon, asked him if they were keeping tabs, they were collecting data on millions of Americans. Clapper got away with saying, well, you know, I gave the least least untruthful answer I could think of. (laughs) And so Sessions issued a statement earlier today, and listen to it carefully. There are weasel words here. I never met with any Russian officials to discuss issues of the campaign. But that's not the statement that he made at the confirmation hearing. He went on to say, I have no idea what this allegation is about. It's false. And Donald Trump didn't say he was a thousand percent behind Jeff Sessions. But in one of those statements that often becomes the kiss of death, 
The president says he has total confidence in Jeff Sessions. <laughs> now, remember, on the day that they forced out Mike Flynn as the national security advisor, Kellyanne Conway got heat and apparently was sidelined from major TV appearances for a while because she kept touting the existing White House line that, oh, yeah, we've got total confidence in Mike Flynn. So <laughs> we'll see uh, if our con man president, the confidence man in chief, maintains that position for long. Now, I think Democrats actually may claim the scalp here. I think that the Trump administration is in disarray responding to these various claims. And I think that because Sessions has been so <clears throat> demanding, extracting a very high standard from Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, and others, that his words will definitely haunt him. Now, first, I'd like you to hear a clip from the Sessions confirmation hearing where he talks about, well, he makes this declaration, and it's pretty flat that he didn't have communications with the Russians. I have been called a surrogate at a time or two in that campaign, and I didn't have, not have communications with the Russians, um, and I'm unable to comment on it. I am concerned. So that's a pretty direct statement. All right. He had no communications with the Russians. Now, meeting with the Russian ambassador in his Senate office involved no communications. I mean, this takes us back to Bill Clinton's perjured testimony about Monica Lewinsky. That he didn't have sex with her. She just had sex with him. <laughs> and that's not all. Jeff Sessions is on the record in so many different cases where he is demanding truthiness, typically from people of the other political party. And following the acquittal of Bill Clinton on the impeachment charges, he said, I fear an acquittal of this president will weaken the legal system by providing an option for those who consider being less than truthful in court. He also dinged Loretta Lynch, and in this case it was appropriate. Loretta Lynch was the attorney general, and last summer she had this bizarre meeting with Bill Clinton. As uh, he went to her plane, they were both private jets parked on the, uh, the field at Phoenix, at the uh, airport there. And it's never been properly explained. And Jeff Sessions correctly called for the attorney general to recuse herself from the investigation into her bizarre meeting with Bill Clinton. And I agree with him about that. <laughs> he said the appropriate response when the subject matter is public and it arises in a highly charged political atmosphere is for the attorney general to appoint a special counsel of great public stature and indisputable independence to assure the public the matter will be handled without partisanship. Right. That's advice from a Republican to a Democrat, but it doesn't apply <laughs> from a Republican to a Republican. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see the next few days. And I don't typically make a lot of predictions. But I think that this could be fatal for Jeff Sessions, and it couldn't happen to a nastier son of a bitch. Today I'm releasing an in-depth interview with Gareth Porter, the independent journalist and historian. And we mostly talk about his recent article at Consortium News, called How New Cold Warriors Cornered Trump. And central to our conversation, Gareth Porter issues a warning to progressives, to Democrats, to be very careful about jumping onto the bandwagon and demonizing Russia, supporting uh, what essentially is a call for a new Cold War, if not militarized conflict with Russia. Here's an excerpt from my conversation with Gareth Porter. There is this campaign of uh, using leaks from uh, former Obama administration intelligence officials, particularly John Brennan, a former CIA director, to implicate uh, Trump aides and, and indeed Trump himself in uh, sort of being uh, having having a an illicit understanding or a deal of some sort or at least configuring 
uh, some some sort of of uh, understanding with the Russians uh, about rolling back the sanctions or or basically ending the state of of tension that has been created during the Obama administration, and that has been uh, that has become a kind of a general uh, cry, a war cry on the part of uh, Democrats and people, uh, generally speaking, on the left. Uh, not everyone, of course, but but this has become sort of a, a a broad, sweeping generalization that people have made uh, who who don't like Trump uh, for for very legitimate reasons, but who have gotten on this bandwagon. And and I believe that this is a very dangerous situation. You can hear the full in-depth interview with Gareth Porter. It's released to subscribers today at PeterBCollins.com, at iTunes, TuneIn, and all of the outlets, uh, except for YouTube. YouTube only carries this uh, free daily news and comment podcast. The in-depth interviews are uh, stored at the other sites. And, of course, uh, subscribers get first access to our in-depth interviews for 14 days. And that means people like uh, Jeffrey Stewart, Terry Paris, Stephen Phillips, and Don Sisney, who are regular subscribers. Steve Phillips just renewed his annual subscription. Thank you, Steve. And uh, they get first dibs. They can access it as soon as I post it. And uh, that's the privilege, the real benefit you get from being a subscriber. I encourage you to become one. Come on over to PeterBCollins.com. You click on the menu button, pull it down, click on Become a Subscriber. It takes you to the sign-up page. That's where the bonus books are displayed, should you choose to take out an annual subscription and supply a mailing address in the continental U.S. Another thing I talked with Gareth Porter about was today's uh, report. It actually came out late yesterday from the New York Times. And again, it's based on unnamed intelligence sources that during the last days of the Obama administration, White House officials scrambled to spread information about the Russian efforts to undermine the election across the government. Now, on the one hand, this seems really slimy. And that they were essentially distributing uh, kryptonite (laughs) to various locations in kind of a doomsday scenario so that the post-attack government would have to deal with this, you know what I mean? And it underscores a point that I aired out with Gareth Porter. If Obama and Clinton and Podesta and all these people truly believe that Russia actually did manipulate our election, why are they content to spread intelligence information around and to perhaps lay the groundwork for a future impeachment but they made no effort to try to prevent Donald Trump from becoming president. And as I've discussed, they had the Electoral College, they had the certification of the uh, election in the joint session of the Congress. They could have filed lawsuits. They had many, many possible remedies. And they were content to commission a bullshit study that was released by the CIA with uh, tepid support from the FBI and the NSA. All this I discuss with Gareth Porter, and I hope you will take the time to listen. Now, we also talk in the Porter interview about Yemen, and he warns of a growing uh, crisis of starvation, that they get all of their food and other supplies imported. There's very little that is uh, internally developed in Yemen. And that because of the ongoing civil war, and the hot war initiated by Saudi Arabia and supported by the United States, that it is reaching crisis proportions. And we have more confirmation, unfortunately, from uh, anonymous intelligence sources that the raid that Donald Trump agreed to over dinner in January that led to the death of an American commando, Ryan Owens, that it did not come away with any useful intelligence. It was a failure. And, of course, Trump doesn't believe that he can ever admit to failing in any way. And so it's a beautiful raid. It was a huge success. And (laughs) just doesn't happen to be true. In the overnight hours uh, Thursday morning, the U.S. launched 20 different airstrikes in Yemen. And uh, this signals that uh, Trump is intent on continuing our involvement in the conflict there. The targets were described as al-Qaeda positions. 
They were part of what appears to be a ramped-up campaign against al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. The U.S. is not just focused on the Islamic State anymore, we're told, but is also uh, confronting the uh, offshoots of al-Qaeda. And the overnight strikes, uh, we're told, will degrade the AQAP's ability to coordinate external terror attacks <clears throat> and limit their ability to use territory seized from the legitimate government of Yemen as a safe place for terror plotting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's really convincing. There's a great piece that Tom dispatched today, and I've linked to it in the show file for this podcast. It's written by Karen Greenberg. And she published a book back about 2003 about the first 100 days of the prison camp at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And today's piece is cleverly written, and it is a lament. A lament that she wanted to write a book about the last 100 days of Guantanamo. She says, I was looking forward with particular relish to writing about the gate slamming shut on the symbol of the way the Bush administration had sent injustice offshore, and about the reopening of the federal courts to Guantanamo detainees, including some of those involved in the planning of the 9-11 attacks. And she goes through all of the impediments, the roadblocks that uh, were erected to closure. She notes in 2011, the National Defense Authorization Act instituted a ban on the transfer of any Gitmo detainee to the United States for any purpose whatsoever. And if federal courts won't deal with them and federal prisons couldn't hold them, then how in the world could Guantanamo ever close? As time goes by, she maintains her hope, her hopeful, wishful vision that it would be closed. She noted the appointment of a man she's familiar with, a guy named Lee Woloski, as the special envoy to close Guantanamo, and that he succeeded in shipping out 75 prisoners about 40% of the population that Obama had inherited. And today the scoreboard shows 41 men held at Guantanamo, five who were cleared for release, 10 military commissions cases, and 26 detainees who are called forever prisoners. And that means that they will be held outside the law <laughs> until something changes. And that means no trial, no charge, and it is flatly unconstitutional, un-American, violates international law. Greenberg also notes how the cost has escalated. It used to only cost about $4 million per prisoner per year. And with the reduced population, that number is now $11 million. But the deficit hawks in Washington aren't concerned about that number. And she closes her lament by saying, For as long as Gitmo remains open, whether we know it or not, we are imprisoned there too. And so is the American way of life. Well, if you're hoping that the effort to repeal and replace Obamacare gets derailed, you should place bets on Ted and Rand and Mike. These are Republican Senators Cruz, Paul, and Lee of Texas, Kentucky, and Utah, respectively. And they believe that the Trump administration, in collusion with Paul Ryan, will continue Obamacare in some form. For example, by shifting the Medicaid uh, funds to block grants to the states, and by using a refundable tax credit that would allow poor people to actually get compensation for all of the money that they pay for health care. So uh, these extremist, ideological purists may be the best hope we have that Republicans will split on the issue and nothing will happen. But the problem is that the insurance companies are going to make sure that the markets implode. And so this is going to be an ugly, ugly specter. And we know that people will get hurt, that people will lose their health insurance, and people will die. And these extremist Republicans don't give a good damn about that. They are committed to repealing this for political and ideological purposes, and it just doesn't matter if you get sick and die. Not to them. A man who admitted he's unqualified for the job he was appointed to was confirmed by the United States Senate today. Ben Carson, the pediatric neurosurgeon, is going to run the Department of Housing and Urban Development, 
And I'm particularly pained by this because uh, one of my brothers works for HUD in Chicago. He has no experience running an organization like this. And he didn't face much critical uh, questioning from Democrats. And he got, uh, let's see, 58 to 41. Uh, that means he got five or six Democrats to vote for him. <laughs> that is really pathetic. And we can be sure one of those was Joe Manchin. He calls himself a Democrat from West Virginia, but uh, barely qualifies for the term, even a lowercase d. Sixteen states across the country are considering bills in their legislatures to make protests more difficult, to penalize people who choose to protest, and to basically declare the First Amendment optional in so many cases. We've been covering this since the first of the year, and... The uh, bill in Iowa, for example, would make blocking high-speed roads a felony punishable by up to five years in prison, $7,500 in fine. Uh, fines in Mississippi. The fine is $10,000. In Washington State, a Republican senator who helped run Trump's campaign there filed legislation that would make it a felony to commit economic terrorism, which is pretty broadly defined as breaking the law to intimidate private citizens or obstruct economic activity. I'll link to the story so that you can see if one of these bills is bubbling up in your state legislature. And while they may get passed and they may get signed, I'm pretty confident that ultimately they will be declared unconstitutional. Timothy Dolan is the Roman Catholic Cardinal presiding over the New York City Archdiocese. And before that, he was the bishop in charge of the Milwaukee Archdiocese. And let me take just a second here to explain Dolan's history. In Milwaukee, he met with the victims of sex abuse by priests. He comforted them. He counseled them. He told them he would take care of them. And when it came time to settle with them financially... What Archbishop Dolan did was transfer most of the money from the accounts of the archdiocese into the cemetery management fund. And then he was able to declare with a face, uh, a, a straight face, that the archdiocese was bankrupt and so sorry, unable to pay the financial settlements to sex abuse victims. So now, Dolan has taken out a $100 million mortgage on the historic St. Patrick's Cathedral to fund compensation for victims of clergy sexual abuse. And if he actually passes out the money to the victims in New York City, I will, um, I'll light a candle at a nearby Roman Catholic church. How's that? But I don't expect I'll have to do that. Because I believe that this slippery dude is going to find a way to make sure that that money doesn't go to the victims. Meanwhile, no relation to me, but the Irish woman, Marie Collins, who was molested by a priest when she was 13, has resigned in protest from the Vatican Commission that she was appointed to to investigate sex abuse by Roman Catholic priests. And she said that uh, the church has uh, offered fine words in public and contrary actions behind closed doors. The only other victim on the commission was suspended from the uh, panel last year after he accused them of failing to deliver on its promises of reform and accountability. And Ms. Collins publicly said that for her the last straw was that a Vatican department was refusing to cooperate with her recommendation that all correspondence from victims of clerical abuse receive a response. She said, I find it impossible to listen to the public statements about the deep concern in the church for the care of those whose lives have been blighted by abuse, yet to watch privately as a congregation in the Vatican refuses to even acknowledge their letters. The reluctance of some in the Vatican Curia to implement recommendations or cooperate with the work of a commission when the purpose is to improve the safety of children and vulnerable adults around the world is unacceptable. And she mentioned that in her years on the panel, she was never given an audience with Pope Francis. I don't know if this has happened to you, but the San Francisco Chronicle is exposing 
that Hertz and other car rental companies are gouging their customers. And the issue has to do with these transponders that we use to pay tolls now. And, for example, the toll on the Golden Gate Bridge is now 750 And if you rent a car from Hertz, you have to pay 5 bucks a day for a convenience fee, up to a maximum of twenty four seventy five. plus you pay full freight on the tolls. Even though when I cross that bridge using a similar transponder, I get a $6 rate. In addition, a five-day rental with a single trip across the Golden Gate Bridge would cost thirty-two twenty-five for the $7.50 toll. Now, in the past, if you rented a car, you could just stop and drop your money off with the toll taker. But we don't have toll takers anymore. And I got burned by this when I went out to Boston in January for my cousin's funeral. And I got this lowball rate, $20 a day on my rental car. And I said, wow, that's great. <laughs> and then when I went to the counter, they said, well, you need one of these transponders just to get out of the airport. There is a single tunnel connecting Logan Airport with the freeway in Boston. And there are no toll takers there anymore. The only way you have no other choice is you've got to rent one of these transponders. And so for in order to pay one toll, I had to pay, I think, an extra $30 for a two-day car rental. Uh, we need to deal with this. <laughs> and we need uniform legislation so that we don't get hosed at different rates by different car companies, car rental companies. A couple of pieces of correspondence I want to acknowledge. Andy Drawl uh, wanted to augment and uh, contrast some of my comments from February 27th when I talked about how uh, undocumented immigrants contribute a net $12 billion to Social Security every year. He said, well, Peter, the Mexican immigrants also send $26 billion back to Mexico out of the U.S., this makes up for the boost to Social Security. By sending the money back to buy pesos, they strengthen the local currency, local economy, weakening ours. I don't agree with that. I don't think that a strong Mexico is, uh, you know, equates automatically to a weakened United States. In addition, he says, illegal workers depress wages and benefits in the U.S. <clears throat> he cites a, UCL, a UCLA study from the mid-2000s and says that uh, a 10% infiltration of illegals causes a 10% drop in wages and benefits. A 20% infiltration, a 20% drop. Well, Andy, that may be true, but that doesn't, that, that doesn't quantify everything. There are a lot of jobs that Americans simply won't take. And to factor in the cost of these unfilled jobs, whether they're washing dishes or you know clipping lawns or whatever it may be, well, those are factors, and I will agree that this is a complex picture. There are many uh, factors and uh, 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 variables that play into this. But uh, I do take your point, and I thank you for emailing me. And finally today, Linda Lewis, who's quite a regular here, she flashed an email with a report on the sorry progress in protecting whistleblowers. The National Defense Authorization Act of 13 introduced a pilot program to expand whistleblower rights against reprisal for executive agencies, contractors, subcontractors, and grantee employees. But officials from four departments reported taking no additional action to communicate to contractors their responsibilities to inform employees of their rights under the pilot program. The 14 departments reviewed, reported receiving, an estimated 1,560 whistleblower reprisal complaints from July of 13 to December of 15. Of those, 127 were submitted by contractor, subcontractor, and grantee employees under the pilot program. The 14 inspectors general investigated 44 of the 127 complaints but did not find that reprisal had occurred in a single one of them. Gives you real confidence, doesn't it, that they're not only protecting whistleblowers, but they care deeply about the information that the whistleblowers are trying to reveal. Thanks for listening to my news and comment podcast. You're free to share it with absolutely everyone. And remember, it's on YouTube every day. I'm Peter B. Happy trails to 
until we meet again happy trails to you keep smiling until then